In our first video presentations on integrated pest management, we discussed integrated pest management as it applied to agriculture and the production of food crops. In this video, we're going to examine the six elements of IPM, people, knowledge, decision making, materials, monitoring, and methods as they pertain to an entire ecosystem. The ecosystem in this case is the spruce forest of South Central and Interior Alaska. There is no place in the North American continent that can equal the beauty of the Alaska wilderness. With its tidewater glaciers, its majestic mountains, and its tremendous softwood forests. Much of South Central and interior Alaska is made up of the spruce forest. Unfortunately, a combination of natural processes combined with a human factor has resulted in the devastation of much of Alaska's spruce forest. The primary culprit in this saga is the tiny spruce bark beetle. The life cycle of the bark beetle begins in the spring when the larvae develop into adult beetles to take flight. Ed Holstein is an entomologist with the U.S. Forest Service in Anchorage. Well, you can see by this tree, this tree was hit just this year. And you can see all the dry, boring dust, which is known as frass, all up and down the dark crevices of the tree, and it piles up around the base of the tree. Now, the beetles have flown probably two, three weeks ago. Uh, the larvae are going to be developing underneath the bark and the foam tissue. This tree will remain alive throughout the summer and will start failing uh, next year. It takes about a year for the tree to out and out die. So this time next year, a year from July, this apparently healthy tree, which has a green crown, will be bright red by next year. And the beetles will probably have one more year of the life cycle to go underneath the bark. But you can see they're selecting these larger diameter, this is about a 13 inch tree, larger diameter trees are the, the trees that the beetles prefer to look at. What we have here are basically three galleries. These egg galleries are probably only two weeks old. There's a female beetle up here, and eggs are being deposited along each side of the gallery. So we, between these three galleries, it's approximately 240 eggs being laid. In a week or so, these eggs will hatch, and the larvae will feed out perpendicular from the egg galleries. And the larvae are feeding on this whitish tissue you see here. It's the foam tissue, very high in carbohydrates, very nutritious for uh, beetle larvae. Their actions of feeding, and that with the associated fungus they carry along, uh, helps grow the tree, and that's what kills the tree. This tissue, this foam tissue, is the food transportation network of the tree. And once it's severed, the tree dies. It can't translocate food from the needles where it's produced down to the other growing portions of the tree. The fungus perme uh, penetrates deeper into the tree, into the xylem vessel, and it blocks the upward movement of water and nutrients from the root. So it's kind of a one-two punch, starving the tree to death, and it dies at first. So this tree was attacked again two weeks ago. It's got a green crown, and it won't show outward symptoms, in other words, foliage color change till next year. Bark beetles generally attack older, declining spruce trees. It can actually be beneficial in that they create gaps in the forest canopy allowing sunlight to reach the forest floor. This provides the needed sunlight for a variety of grasses and small plants. Young, healthy spruce trees have a natural defense against the beetle invasion. When a healthy tree is attacked, it will produce enough pitch that it will actually expel the beetle from the tree. Later, if the beetles have been successful in entering the tree, the tree's immune system will create a reaction zone which walls off developing beetles and kills them. Over the last 10 years, winter temperatures in Alaska have warmed significantly. This has resulted in many more beetles being able to survive through the winter cold. And 
and in many cases, they are now completing their normal two-year life cycle in one year, which means they are producing twice as many new beetles in one year. With this increase in population, beetles are not only attacking the older trees successfully, but the defense system of young healthy trees can't keep up with the numbers of beetles. The result has been disastrous. The spruce forest has been ninety percent destroyed, and along with it, wildlife habitat, plus the danger of catastrophic fire sweeping through the area is very high. This bugbear outbreak facing Alaska's border forest is no doubt the biggest ecological disturbance by the Everton. So in the long term, we're going to see a major change in our forest structure and composition because uh, we've lost all the seed trees. Uh, so we're not going to get uh, spruce stands coming back into these areas. Now we're faced with enormous fuel loads. fuel buildup, which means you're going to have hotter fires, uh, a higher probability of fire starts, and very difficult fires to control. To the point where a, a green stand of spruce normally only has two tons per acre of large woody debris on the ground. After the beetles come through, trees fall down, we're up to 60 tons per acre now. You might think of the devastation caused by the spruce bark beetle as a natural process as something that was unavoidable. But that is not the case. If integrated pest management had been applied when the spruce bark beetle problem was first identified, much of the devastation caused by this beetle could have been avoided, all without the application of any man-made chemicals or pesticides. Uh, integrated pest management is just a philosophy and uh, based on a couple of premises. One, uh, first, you have to determine, is this plant or animal really a pest? And is it causing economic damage to you, or can you live with it? And then, uh, there's a list of options uh, covering, uh, like, mechanical techniques, cultural techniques, and chemical uh, techniques. And uh, the, whole, the whole purpose of IPM is not to eliminate the use of chemicals, but to minimize their use if possible. Well, you have better options at minimizing pesticide use uh, when populations are fairly small uh, and building up, and a lot of your cultural techniques uh, work pretty good. The problem is, is for 20 years, it is very, very hard to, especially in a forestry situation, and as entomologists, when you see a potential problem in the building, and you go to that landowner and you say, if you don't do anything, there's pretty good possibility, pretty good odds that you're going to have a real problem. And they say, well, are you 100% sure we're going to have a problem? No, I'm not 100% sure. But buildings lining up. And, okay, what do we need to do? Well, you need to get in and manage these stands, cultural type techniques. You need to thin them out. Uh, change your age classes, etc., etc. And they say, "Well, uh, we well we really don't see any beetles here yet. We don't want to have to go in and harvest, and so let's just wait and see." Well, then when you wait and see, and an outbreak flares up, you have lost your options at uh, cultural techniques uh, because the population now is so large, it's like spitting into the wind. Now, the only option is, is to do nothing or rely on pesticides, single tree application of pesticides. Uh, they've lost those uh, options of uh, cultural techniques and mechanics. 
Beetles are most successful in closed, overstock stands of even age trees. If the trees are selectively cut and then peeled, it allows for open areas which encourage new seeds and growth, and the beetle kill is much less successful. In areas where thinning was permitted, there was very little beetle damage for a number of years. Unfortunately, public outcry prevented further thinning efforts. The public felt that it was just an excuse to log the area. In areas of the forest which have been damaged and trees uprooted by high winds, the problem is even worse because beetles prefer to breed in down trees. Down trees produce five to ten times the number of beetles that standing trees produce. Again, public outcry prevented salvage logging operations from coming in to clean out the dead trees. Many believe that since the spruce bark beetle infestation was a natural process, that the trees would naturally regenerate themselves. Unfortunately, this is not happening. Where the beetles have killed the spruce trees, grasses and hardwoods are taking over and are choking out all other vegetation. Even attempts to plant seedlings have been for the most part unsuccessful. So it is very likely that much of this spruce forest will become a grassland. There was always a misconception up here uh, that it was a cyclical type of thing. You'd have beetles, and then you'd have, you know, succession would start over again, and you'd end up with the spruce forest again. So why worry about this? Uh, but that's not what's happening. And that, that came about from a lot of monitoring plots that have been established in the last 20 years, where we go in, we went in before beetles got into stands, and we've been following changes in overstory and regeneration. And uh, we know those types of stands are going to look quite a bit different. I've been dealing with this for 22 years up here. And uh, the lesson is there's, there's, a, there's a couple. One from integrated pest management in fortunate situations. Uh, the sooner, sooner you jump on a potential problem, uh, even though it's costly, it's going to far outweigh the cost of doing nothing and having a problem. Uh, for example, thinning a stand of trees may cost you, you know, it's pretty intensive. It may cost you $600 an acre to do that. Uh, if you don't do that, and beetles come through that stand, uh, it's going to cost you probably $1,500 to $2,000 an acre to get rid of the dead trees, prepare the site, and plant trees. So if you, if, you, if you would have spent the original 600, you'd still have green trees out there. But at 600 bucks an acre, you know, 20 years ago, people are going, oh, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to take my chances. But and having dealt with this 20 years ago, um, our biggest problem from agency standpoint was that uh, we were perceived as crying wolf all the time, but we couldn't produce a wolf other than trees were being killed. And then we proposed a salvage uh, harvest in there, and then, and then what happened is people said, well, gee whiz, it is using beetles as kind of a smoke screen to cut more timber. We said, well, there's a lot more impacts going on. The problem is, is we just don't have studies in place. Like I said, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and Fish and Game state agencies it took us 15 years to finally convince the wildlife biologists that, guys, this outbreak is not stopping. Um, it's not slowing down. And they're, they're, you're a wildlife biologist. There, there has to be some impacts to wildlife habitat going on here. And finally, we formed a, it's called the Interagency Forest Ecology Study Team, but mostly made up of wildlife biologists. And... Um, now we're getting data, and sure enough, there are significant changes in wildlife habitat. But in the beginning, we were less politicized as an agency, uh, but we didn't have enough information when we went to the public to say, this is something besides killing trees. 
uh, there's potentially other impacts. We didn't have good data on fuel buildup. We, didn't, we had no data on wildlife habitat changes. Um, and if we would have done it differently, I think in retrospect, since the most important resources on the Chigach National Forest are basically wildlife habitat, wildlife viewing, recreation, fishing, things like that, we could have managed a lot of our stands of spruce to, to prevent uh, a potential buildup of spruce beetle at the same time enhancing wildlife habitat. The devastation caused by the spruce bark beetle destroyed about 90% of the spruce forest in South Central and Interior Alaska, an area more than 3 million acres large. It's the largest recorded beetle kill in history. The effects of this beetle kill will be felt for many generations, and the spruce forest will be replaced by hardwood forests and grasslands. For the Haskell Environmental Research Study Center, I'm Dan Wildcat.